Welcome to On Health with Houston Methodist. I'm Zach Moore. I'm a photographer and editor here, and I've worked in multimedia and television for over 15 years, and I'm also a longtime podcaster. I'm Todd Ackerman. I'm a writer-editor who previously covered science and medicine for the Houston Chronicle. And Todd, do you consider yourself a night owl or a morning lark? I am a night owl to the hilt. <laughs> this term morning lark seems new to me. I had not yeah. heard it until we looked into this topic. Yeah, I encountered it in some literature, but it was the first I'd, I'd heard of it as well. I am similar to you. I'm, I'm a night owl by nature. As, as we discussed, an interesting topic of conversation is, is nature versus nurture with these kinds of things. And have you tried to break the mold of being a night owl or have you decided, you know what, this is who I am and I'm going to be a night owl? Yeah, I really haven't tried to change. Uh, I can remember being a night owl since I was a kid and uh, my career journalism has only hardened my, my tendencies as you have a very flexible schedule and doesn't start early and goes later. So I've made it this far. I, I think uh, I think this is who I am. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I used to work in television and I used I probably destroyed whatever circadian rhythm I had naturally when went after college because I would work uh, the morning news. So I would get there at four and then I'd work till about one or so. Then I'd go home and take a nap for about four hours and then get up and live life with other people and be out till, I don't know, maybe around 11 or midnight, take another four hour nap, get up, go to work. Not every day, but a lot of times. And you know, when you're like 22, right. <laughs> you can probably do that. I would, I don't think I could pull that off today, but even further back, you think, I, I think, you know, kids, kids always want to stay up late because they want to like break the rules and, you know, just, oh, my bedtime's here, but I want to push the boundaries there. And Personally, like I feel like, yeah, just that's your time at night and you want to keep it going because once you go to sleep, you got to reset, you wake up and the day starts. And I think that's where kind of our drive to like stay up late is. Yes, absolutely. I would say that to people who even in my business were struck at how late my hours were. And, and I would say when I go home, that's, that's my time. And so the last thing I want to do is go right to bed and start all over again. Right. So in our quest to better understand this mystery, Todd, who do we talk to this week? We spoke with... Dr. Randall Wright, a neurologist at Houston Methodist and a sleep medicine expert. Maybe we could start out broadly and, and just from a sort of neurological point of view, what do we know about night owls versus morning birds? Those are old tales that we've always kind of coined the terms. Uh, they're a night owl or a morning lark, we sometimes call it. Uh, I think we figured out pretty early in life where we think we are at that time and then throughout life, we're out of solidified or change. But I remember when I was growing up, I used to always love to stay up late. But waking up early was kind of a struggle for me to do so. But then as time went on, I, I really kind of changed it to where I'd rather wake up early and go to bed a little bit earlier. And so I would flip-flop throughout life. And sometimes it worked out well for me that I could think through it, especially in medical school and residency. As we're training, we're, we're kind of forced to to go one direction, you know, when you're on call, you're up all night and then the next day you have to perform well. And sometimes that works out well, but sometimes after a while it catches up with you. And so sleep is one of those episodes of life that would change over our lifespan. So the concept of the night owl and the morning lark really refers to our chronotype. And that's kind of a new buzzword that we're using a lot now that tells what is our natural tendency for peak performance. And it's based upon our circadian rhythm. And we all have that, as you know, as sometimes you may wake up in the morning and you feel energized, but then towards the evening, we start to kind of get sleepy, right? And that's, that's normal. We all go through that. But even in that variation, some of us, and you may, I'm not sure, do you know where you are, how you feel? I've always considered myself a night owl. I have a journalism background and, and the business is sort of facilitates that just in that you go to work a little later and you work later. Um, we don't have those hospital hours where, <laughs> you know, doctors are there at 7 a.m. or whatever time it is. Right. You know, and so we, we do that. So, so sometimes work puts us into a particular phase that we need to work through. And some of us that works well, some of us it doesn't. And so the night owl refers to individuals who have a preference towards staying up later so instead of going to bed at 10 o'clock, maybe you want to go to bed at 11, 12, 1 o'clock and then sleep in later, whereas the morning larks tend to go to bed earlier, 8, 7 sometimes, and then wake up earlier. Is it sort of an either or thing or, or is there a, a continuum there that people are on that sort of some could be a middle group? 
So a quarter of our population, about 25 percent, will be, well, in theory, will be a morning lark. Another quarter will be night owls. And the other 50 percent will be some variation of that time frame. So, so it, it, it varies. How about people who alternate according to the, the season? I have a colleague who was telling me that during the summer, he becomes more of a night owl. During the winter, he's more of an early riser. So our sleep changes to some degree. And why is that? Because we are, as humans, we are tied to the sun. The sun makes a big difference in how we respond to lots of things. That's where the whole circadian rhythm comes from, is that the sun really tells us when we should wake up and when we should go to bed. And so as the seasons change, the cues from the sun will change for us. And based upon where you are in certain states, in certain time zones, all those things will play into effect of how our body responds to when we wake up. So bright light, white light makes us wake up. That's it's a cue to the brain through a little nucleus called a suprachiasmatic nucleus that, hey, it's time to wake up and it blocks melatonin. Um, as the sun starts to go down in the evening, the light goes down, it changes. Um, the quality and the color of the light on the spectrum changes and melatonin starts to get produced more as it goes down. And so the timing of that is gonna vary based on season based on where we are in that particular time zone. And so you can get lots of different variations from where you are. Over our lifespan, our circadian rhythms will change over time. So when we're younger, uh, we tend to be very much skewed forward. So we're kids, you know, we will fall asleep earlier and get lots of wants to sleep for a very long time. Kids can sleep 12, 13 hours for a long time. As we get older, as we approach adolescence, the time that we need to sleep goes down to come down to a more normal adult type, um, getting down to the seven to eight and then six to eight hours. So it starts to skew. And they also start to skew when they go to bed, which is starts to annoy parents <laughs> because now they want to stay up later. I have two young boys and I can literally remember that my son around nine thirty, ten o'clock would just literally fall over. He could be watching TV, anything, and then just clumps over because he's done. Now that same kid is pushing one o'clock when he wants to go to bed and just within a year and a half that's changed. So our so our chronology, our, our, our circadian rhythms will change over time. In the adults and young adults, they really start to push the limits and their natural biology wants them to go to bed around 11 to one o'clock and so they can stay up late. So our college students, they're naturally up and, and prowling all night long because that's kind of what their, their chronotypes and, and where they are in their circadian rhythm dictates. As we get into you know adulthood, it, it kind of comes back down to a, a different time zone. But then as we get older, um, our, our ability to sleep starts to decrease and we start to shift back to almost a childlike time where we start to want to go to bed earlier. So yeah, so over time, we start to see a transition in how our circadian rhythms will function. Because Dr. Wright referenced circadian rhythms a number of times, we thought we'd talk a little more about the concept, which you may know better as one's biological clock. These circadian rhythms coordinate our physical, mental, and behavioral changes and repeat roughly every 24 hours. In other words, they make sure the body's processes are optimized at various points during the day. The term circadian comes from the Latin word circa, meaning around, and diem, meaning day. That is, around a day. When people talk about circadian rhythms, it's often in the context of sleep. The sleep-wake cycle is one of the most clear examples of the importance of circadian rhythms. The most powerful influence on circadian rhythms is light. During the day, it causes your internal clock to send signals that generate alertness, and help keep us awake and active. When daylight fades, your circadian rhythms signal your brain to make more melatonin, a hormone that makes you sleepy. When the sun rises, they tell the brain to turn down the melatonin. Internal disruptions can throw our circadian rhythms out of whack. Jet lag, which causes insomnia and sluggishness and distractedness, is the classic example of the sort of malaise caused by circadian confusion. Staying up late over the weekend, dubbed social jet lag, can have the same effect. New understandings into people's biological clocks are giving birth to a new field, circadian medicine, which involves research into the best times to eat, exercise, or take medications. But that's probably a topic for another podcast.
So is this definitely a, a genetic thing or does the environment play a role? I mean, society is so geared towards early birds, it seems. Yeah. And so I like to think of it as genetics sets the stage, but we put on the play. So genetics will bless us with an ability or a, a chronotype that we we have genetic, you know, naturally. So some are naturally just early risers, some are naturally late, start late, late crawlers. Um, but but we can also to have an environment that can change it. If we're forced to do shift work, for example, then we're gonna we're gonna change the way we behave. If you're in an environment that you know, for residency, we were forced to kind of work harder and longer, sometimes we'll change that. And so we can adapt to it. The issue with adaptation though is that in some cases it's not good for our health because when you start to work against our chronotype, we can have predisposition to certain diseases. Inflammation, our immune system has changed. We've seen an increase in, in cardiac diseases, certain cancers that can result from individuals who have worked against their chronotype. So we can do it, but there may be a cost. We're starting to understand more of that in recent years. So if early birds were to work a night shift, they could have this problem just as night owls having to get up quite early in the morning could have those same sort of Absolutely. Issues. It was interesting because even during the pandemic, we started to see changes in our work patterns. <laughs> and then people started working from home and they could almost get into their natural chronotype and they can be more efficient because they, they can sleep in later. They could do different things. And so I think we may well see a shift in how we and we should see a shift in how we look at work, because a lot of the work hours were set a long time ago based upon the sun. And it all ties into allowing people to work on their natural chronotypes. And I think it's a, it's a wise thing. Um, even for high schools, we see that some high schools have pushed back their start times um, to allow the students to get to school later to sleep in longer. So it sounds like you're saying it's not a bad thing to be a night owl. It seems like everything I've read <laughs> in my entire life is that it is kind of a bad thing. No, not at all. You know, now what you do in the night is a different story, <laughs> but, but to have that natural tendency is just fine. But just because historically society has been so so operates on on a day schedule, yeah, it's a bad thing in the sense that you're working against your chronotype. Yes, and those are I love these interesting kind of kind of kind of philosophical questions because you know, a long time ago, you know, the ability to work at night wasn't as easy as it is now. And then before you had lights on and everything, it was just the daylight was when you got your work done. And then when when it was down, we had to stop because we couldn't do anything. Then you invent lights and incandescent lights, and now we can keep that going on at nighttime. But then now we have different devices that emit LEDs, that emit a different spectrum of light in which we love to look at our phones before we go to bed. And so now light becomes a big factor in, in sleep problems because now we can have light on us nearly 24-7. Um, and that disrupts our melatonin production, which is what a big driver of sleep. And so now that we can work, it's a whole different story. And we get in a lot of different <laughs> conditions and issues that result from that. So talking about your biological clock and knowing your own preferences and, and tendencies, do you sleep like blackout curtains and need complete darkness to go to sleep or does sunlight wake you up? Do you, do you feel the first rays of the sun on your face when you wake up or do you feel that affecting you in your everyday life, Todd? Yeah, I can't honestly say I do. I I, I haven't done that complete blackout that they recommend. Um, I tried it recently and it, it did seem to help fall asleep faster. So maybe I should. But once I'm out, I sleep through earthquakes, so uh, the, the light doesn't necessarily wake me. Yeah, like anything else health-related, you know, we kind of lose track sometimes and lose sight of the fact that, you know, we should really be the top experts on our own bodies, right? Like what, what sleep cycles work for us or those sorts of things because you, you, can, you can try so hard to do something. And as, and as he said, like it's, it's kind of nature versus nurture almost, like your, your, your patterns. You can be born a certain way and you can fight it for a certain amount of time to get through medical school or get through a certain job. But from what I took from him, you're going to kind of fall back into whatever you were born into. Yeah, which was which was great news for me to hear. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no point in even trying to change because your body's going to force you to go back to what I've, you were. I spent my whole life thinking this is a negative quality I have that of a night owl, and so for him to say you are who you are, I took some solace in that. Yeah, I remember in in high school, I uh, senior of high school, I, I had off periods, I, and I took my first two periods off. So I went to school at like 
nine fifteen in high school. And in normal high school, you know, if, if you had full seven periods, you get there like at like seven or something, right? And I remember my mom telling me like, don't get used to this. When you go to college, you're going to have to get up early. And, and sure enough, I signed up for college and I started all my classes at 10 o'clock and it was great. <laughs> so it's just having, having that kind of control over your schedule. But I've, I've always thought this was interesting because you go to grade school for like 12 years and it, it's more or less, it's not quite an eight to five. It's like a, you know, seven to two or, you know, variations of that, right? You do that for 12 years, you have the schedule that you're, you kind of settle into of like, this is how everyday life is. And then you go to college and it's like, well, you can take, you know, classes on Tuesday and Thursday, maybe you start at noon or this or that. So you have this, not everybody, because everybody, not everybody goes to college and, you know, not everybody has the same kind of schedule, but for a large majority of people, like your schedule is completely out of whack in, in college. And then you finish your four or five years and then you go back into the workforce eight to five. And it's just this strange anomaly like connecting the two of like the, the workforce adulthood and the grade school. And it's like, I, I, I don't know, I feel like college, I screw up whatever kind of patterns or your habits you develop when you're younger. I think some people had it forced on them even in college with a lot of classes that were only available at, at 8 a.m. I, I too was able to find classes. <laughs> <laughs> Level arts majors here, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> but yes, it's, uh, it's, it's probably telling that I never went into a profession that requires you to be at work at, at 8 a.m. But, you know, he, Dr. Wright himself mentioned that, that he was a night owl and, and was able to change. So I guess it is possible. From annual checkups to managing chronic conditions, your health care should be personalized to you. At Houston Methodist, our primary care doctors provide customized care for you and your family with more than 40 convenient locations across greater Houston. We offer a variety of ways to get care from in-person and virtual appointments to same-day visits when you're sick. Choose your doctor and schedule online at HoustonMethodist.org slash stay healthy. Houston Methodist, leading medicine. Are there any generalizations we can make about the, the two categories beyond that, if how it affects your chronotype? Say, are, are early risers more productive, better test takers, like it seems I've read over the years? <laughs> I think it's if you operate in your chronotype, you can do amazing things. It's when we're not operating. And, and gets back to your earlier question about society is really a little biased towards the, the morning larks. Some restaurants open up early, some close early, and certain towns, it's, everything's shut down early. And so it's really biased towards the morning larks. You might argue that the population may be larger in those segments because it's really just 25% who are naturally that, the, the night owls. And then you have that, that middle group, age group of the young adults who are in that category. But the rest may be in the early risers. And so society does kind of have a bias towards that. And with that being the case, if someone's trying to operate in that system, may have more difficulty. But I think if we start to make more accommodations that fit with, the, with that chronotype, I think they can do it just as fine. And, and how about health impact? Same thing. It's just if you're in your chronotype uh, milieu, then, then it's okay. Or are there inherently any higher risks from being a night owl? Most people don't recognize that their their chronotype exists, and we all try to force ourselves to be in bed, you know, by ten and up by six or whatever that that that, that small window is. But many individuals who, if you if you're a night owl and you didn't realize that, and you're trying to go to bed early, you're really missing your your window of performance, and you're going to bed at a time when your body is just not ready, and so then you're going to perceive yourself as having insomnia, and then you're going to seek treatments for that. And you might take medications to try to put you to sleep earlier and all kind of things that can result from that when you're really just fighting against your biology. <laughs> and so so in our practice, we're I'm not quick to prescribe medications. I do try to take some time to understand someone's chronotype, understand what are the factors that are contributing to their insomnia that may be biological, maybe maybe a sleep apnea and maybe some, some kind of medical condition before jumping to prescribing medication because if I can get you sleeping naturally, that's going to be really to your advantage. Is there any left brain, right brain component to this? I read some suggestion that, that night owls are more creative. Is there any <laughs> truth to that? <laughs> that's another fun conversation because creativity is one thing that or uh, one entity that is really good if you get a good night's sleep, especially when we get into the dreaming conversation as far as why do we dream and what can happen when we're dreaming. It's a time when our brain is disinhibited. We can, there are no holds barred. And so 
one may argue that the more you sleep or getting a lot of sleep allows you to have those times of creativity when we're dreaming. And so what side of the brain that affects? I think it affect all sides of the brain. It can make you a better mathematician because you think of math problems in a different way. Many of our geniuses throughout the years um, in the past who had their great epiphanies with, with, with mathematics came from the creative side. And though they are thought of to be very logical, right? So, so it really go, I think a good night's sleep floats all boats. So, so can you change, like say a, a morning person gets a job as a shift worker, what can they do about that? So I do believe that we can change how we perform, right? So we can change, we can become a shift worker. I can, when I'm a resident, I can start working all night. The real question is, if I do that, what happens to me biologically, right? Is that a good thing? Because many studies are showing that shift workers may increase their risk of certain conditions like heart disease, certain cancers, certain cognitive disorders, because there is that, that shift from sleeping in our natural rhythm, our chronotype. And when, that, when we change from that, our immune systems start to go a little bit awry, and we're seeing that those things can happen. So, so we can do it. The question is, should we? Or should we work for society that allows us to really work in our in our chronotype? And you may ask, why do we have chronotypes? Maybe that's why. So it's like filtering out, okay, who should be the night shift people? There's your night owls, and then you go for it. Who's the day shift people? There's your morning larks, go for it. Maybe working with our biology may actually give us better outcomes when we do have jobs that need to get done. As long as, as we do have jobs that force some people into <laughs> right. the opposite of their chronotype, is there any tips you have on how to adapt? That's the beauty of as we understand more about sleep and we understand why we sleep and how we sleep, we can start to do things that allow us to maybe improve it or take a situation, make it better. So, for example, we know that light is a driving factor for sleep. So when it's bright in the morning, that's a cue to our brain to wake up. Time to get up. Let's get going. When it gets darker, it's a cue for us to start to go to bed. So we can start, we can use that information to, to start to create an environment that's best, best for us, for our sleeping. We call that sleep hygiene. And so some of the tips or tricks that we use for sleep hygiene for individuals who may suffer from insomnia is to make sure that when it's time to go to bed, they, they create a routine. And that's what allows shift workers to do better, is that when they have a routine that they do, and any of us, we perform best in a routine. Our brains love routine. And so going to bed around the same time every night and waking up around the same time in the morning, that does the brain a great job. When we're erratic in that behavior, we, we don't do as well. We, we, we're sleepier. Uh, we know that a, a decrease in temperature by one degree is a sign to the brain that it's time to go to bed. So if a shift worker is trying to go to bed, and there's, it's daytime, get the blackout shades, keep it dark, but also start to drop the temperature in the room. Around 68, 67 degrees is kind of where the brain likes to be when it's time to sleep. But it's also the falling temperature that is a trigger to the brain that it's time to go to sleep. So oftentimes say, hey, take a warm shower and then go to bed um, into a cool room. And that transition tells the brain it's, 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 an, it's, it's a natural trigger to tell the brain that it's time to go to bed. So those kind of tricks can be helpful in helping someone ingrain a routine that's off their natural chronotype. A shower both wakes you, you know, I'm a, as a night ally, I <laughs> often find the only thing that gets me awake in the morning is the shower. Uh, the showers both wake you up and get you ready for sleep. So if, you, if you've been in the bed all night and you're kind of cozy in the bed and you hit a cold shower, yes, I'm waking well, up big time. <laughs> well, I don't have cold showers. You don't have cold showers. No. <laughs> Yeah, but no, but the body is very sensitive to temperature and also too, a rise in temperature is a very strong arousal. So in our household, so my wife and I, we've, we've over the years have fought about bedtimes and things like that until we got a device that allowed us to control the temperature from my phone. That was an amazing device for me. And so I was able to set that around a certain time, the house starts to cool. And now we have our trigger to start to go to bed. But in the morning time, it starts to heat up and I can feel it. I can tell when, what time it is by when I feel the heat rising. I'm like, okay, now it's time to get up because heat, even from my deep sleep, wakes me up without having light, without having an alarm. I can tell when the temperature rises. So does society, schools need to 
should this be more of a topic of conversation that we need to sort of identify what you are and so for what direction direction you want to go in life so are you suggesting that instead of placement test we have chronotype test yeah. <laughs> yeah i think that would be wonderful um because knowing who you have there makes a big difference in, in what's going on um now i'm not sure if they can ever stagger school based upon someone's chronotype test but i think and because uh, on average we're going there's going to be a, a lot of the students who are in high school and college we know what they are for the most part, right? But but there may be, when it comes down to job um, duties and assigning roles, I think it'd be very helpful to know what you have. You might not place that early morning meeting um, at 7 a.m. if you got a room full of, of night owls there, <laughs> you know? You might push it back towards later in the evening. So I think you can have a smarter business, a smarter university, if we start to utilize this information. In summary, I guess what you're saying is that the big issue isn't whether you're a night owl or a morning person, it's identifying what you are. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, no one's better, night owl, morning lark. They're both amazing you know, categories of people. But if you're not operating in your natural zone, you're not going to be as efficient. Um, and so as we start to talk about this, so thank you for the conversation today, because I think it's a, it's a great topic to start off with. Um, as we start to identify that, we can A, optimize our own personal performance, and also start to help prevent certain diseases. Because if you're recognizing that these, this, these sleeping mis mismatches of not operating in your chronotype um, can be a risk factor for certain diseases, wouldn't it be amazing to start, to start to really prevent some of those things? And that's what really, from my vantage point as a brain wellness provider who looks for that, it gets me super excited. Okay, very good. All right, anything else you want to add or... Sleep is it's one of these pillars of health that are whatever you want to call it, um, that has been very much underrepresented for a very long time. Um, we used to, people used to say that you can sleep when you're dead. Well, no. <laughs> if you don't sleep, you will be dead sooner, right? Because we need to sleep. Sleep really is almost a foundation for all the other things that we do, such as eating and exercising. All those are altered by sleep. Our performance is altered by sleep. And so trying to cut down how much sleep we get is not the answer. It's trying to optimize sleep is the answer. And we should talk about it some more. All right, great. Well, thank you for taking time to explain some of these issues to us. <laughs> awesome. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, that was a great conversation you had with Dr. Wright Todd. Something that stuck out to me was his mentioning the lowering of your own temperature to kind of put you into that sleep state. And you guys talked a little bit about showering and, and I'm, a, I'm a, I prefer to be a night showerer. I like taking like warm showers at night. And maybe that's why I feel like I sleep pretty well. I'm a pretty, you know, you mentioned earlier, you can sleep through an earthquake. I feel like I'm a pretty deep sleeper as well. And there's a science to that. As he said, like, you know, if you, if you take a hot shower and you go to a cool room, you just kind of drift off and, and then you're, you're good. Right. So are you, what's your shower situation? You have morning night shower. I'm definitely a morning shower. Oh, okay. uh, that's the only thing that wakes me up, helps me wake up, partly because it clears up my sinuses. <laughs> um, but it's always a hot shower, and I still find that that is helpful. I, I only take showers at night when I've worked out and come back, and, and I agree that that does seem to get you in, into sort of a more mellow mood that it's that it's more natural to fall asleep then. To soothing. Yeah. Do it, yeah. Yeah. And trying to, you know, we mentioned off the top, trying to break that mold, right, of being a night owl or a morning lark. And ultimately, society seems, to, as you mentioned in your conversation, leans to favor the morning larks. Yes. Uh, he seemed to indicate that maybe there was some possibility to change that. Um, I'm not real optimistic. I think the key is to find something that fits your chronotype. Um, if, if you're a uh, morning lark, obviously, society is already geared to you. But if you're if you're more of a night owl, the best thing is probably to find something that, that fits your natural schedule. Yeah, he mentioned even testing for, you know, the sort of thing when you're younger as far as aptitude tests. And, and I, I don't know, I think that's a great idea. But I, I, when you're a kid, it might not be developed yet. So maybe that's not the best time either. It's just one of these things you kind of figure out as you grow. Right. Yeah. Uh, to me, it sounds great, too. But I'll, I, I think that's going to be a, a lot of years before <laughs> society ever gets to that point. And as he mentioned, you know, the, the way technology has evolved and the, a lot more work can be done. 
at night, right? Maybe we have electricity. Even even 100, 150 years ago, it's like, well, it's dark now, so unless you have a candle, you can't get much done. But there's a lot of opportunity out there to work a different uh, schedule. But again, like, does it correlate with a field that you have a good aptitude in, that you're interested in? So there's all there's a lot of factors that people maybe not be considering when they pick a career that you know maybe they should because sleep is something that you have to do every day. So having it fit into a good rhythm for your own body is going to be in the long run best for your health. I, th- I agree that it would be great if we could make these changes and maybe maybe we can make them uh, as work becomes more remote. Um, it certainly gives people a lot more flexibility to fit things into their schedule. Absolutely. Well, that's going to do it for us this week on the On Health Podcast. And we encourage you all to go to our blog at houstonmethodist.org slash blog and to share, like, and subscribe to our podcast. New episodes drop Tuesday mornings. So until then, stay tuned and stay healthy. Houston Methodist Hospital has been named the best hospital in Texas for 11 years in a row by U.S. News and World Report. Houston Methodist Hospital is the number one hospital in Texas and number 15 in the nation. We are nationally ranked in 10 specialties, the most in the state. For more than 100 years, we have provided you the best and safest clinical care, advanced technology, and patient experience. That's our promise of leading medicine. Houston Methodist, leading medicine.